Hello and welcome to the WYHS Journal, Public Affairs from 104.9 FM. I'm Paul Kretschmer. On today's broadcast, once again, we're talking about the relationship between believers in the Christian faith. And my last observation was that Billy Graham protected himself by never being with a person of the opposite gender alone. And so they had developed all of these principles to hold one another accountable so that they would be above reproach um, as people who had had a lot of influence and who were traveling a lot. And we only know the Billy Graham rule as far as it was, you know, went with men and women. Yeah. Um, but that entire, um, the, that entire set of uh, principles that they committed themselves to as evangelists just had such wisdom for their context. And I think one of the things I want to distinguish between in the book is that there was more at play uh, with Billy Graham's um, decision to be wise in that regard than just relationships between men and women. There was also a power dynamic and a fame dynamic, which changes the game. You know, that's not the same as just uh, me and John, who I sit next to in the pews at church. This has to do with um, star status and mm. being away from home. There Power adds a whole bunch of new dynamics that are over and above um, just general relational dynamics. Is that one of the reasons why you think a book in, like this is important in today's culture and environment? Absolutely, I do. I mean, I think so much of wisdom has to do with knowing when to apply things. Wisdom knows how to read a room. And the rules that are right for one age and one situation and one person are probably unfairly applied to most everybody. And um, I, I, I think Billy Graham was doing exactly the right thing, you know. And um, our pastoral staff, I'm on, a past, on the pastoral staff at a local Baptist church in town, and uh, we have chosen to have glass doors um, for all of our offices so that there can be, I mean, literal transparency when we are meeting with members of our parish. But that doesn't mean that when everybody goes home that they should have glass doors in their houses. Um, you know, there's something about being in the church context where people are disclosing vulnerabilities and there are power dynamics and play and, um, you know, the things you share with your pastor in confidence are not always things that they're sharing back with you. Those, those are not reciprocal relationships. Mm -hmm. And so there's a high bar. But it's different when that pastor is going out with their friends. You know, there's, there's a different level of disclosure. So I think that this book is saying, hey, um, when there's no power dynamics involved, which is the case with most of our relationships within the Christian community, we're just side by side worshiping. How do we live as family? How do we be brothers and sisters around the table, around the worship table, and get busy with God our Father's business in partnership? Uh, two observations for you to, to to reflect back at me with your view. One of yeah. one of which is, how does the church's "don't touch, don't talk" rules negatively impact Christian culture and fellowship? That's one point. And then another one is, it sounds from what you've told me so far that that so very much of our relationship with our fellow believers is intended by God to be very intentional not something that just happens or not just something that you fall into, not, 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 not as a substitute or a valve to blow off steam when you're, not, when you're not happy at home or with other friends, and so this is somehow a way out of your discontent uh, to make yourself happy at that moment without thinking of the consequences. Absolutely. Um, okay, let me. Those are two very different questions. So, first one: How do the "don't talk, don't touch" rules negatively affect the church? Um, well, I think we miss out when we don't hear one another's perspectives. You know, in our large family reunions, when my family gets together, sometimes uh, my sisters and I like to go off and do girl things, and the guys sometimes like to go off and do brother things. Um, but if we spent all of our time siloing off by guys and girls, we would miss some of the big family catch-up, mm -hmm. uh, some of the big project conversations and projects that we need to take care of. You know, Auntie Betty, we want to plan a family vacation. We, we miss out on some big picture stuff when we're not regularly in communication as the family of God. And I think we miss out on people's gifts and insights and wisdom when we're not talking to each other. So I think that's one of the big the big dangers. Uh, the second big danger is, is, as you said at the beginning, uh, for those who aren't part of a nuclear family, they get left out. You know, the, the stats are that like 40% of the church is made up of single people, and they should belong and feel that they belong 
to the household of God, because God has made them part of the household. But if we keep cold-shouldering people as if they're a threat or a, um, a predator, then we're not really making space for them. So um, we need to live into that truth. And that leads me into the second one. Yes, I absolutely agree we need to be intentional about these relationships, and I'll tell you why. You know, we've spent a lot of time in the last couple of years talking about identity and living as the children of God. You know, God has made us his children. He's adopted us. He calls us his father. And part of the big work we need to do as believers is to kind of learn to live as if that's true. You know, to replace all our false identities and and idols and live as the beloved children of God. Because as 1 John 3 says, that is what we are. That is what we are. It just takes us a while to figure out what that means. And that takes some intentional living into identity. And I think it's the next step for us to say, you know, if we have all been adopted by the same father, then our relationship to one another is adopted siblings with the family. And no kid who is adopted as an adult into a family knows how that family works when they get going, right? They, an adopted child has the name, the privilege, privileges, they have the inheritance. On paper, they, have, they fully belong to the family. But it takes some intentionality to learn how the family works, to get comfortable with everybody's name, to learn the new way of being. And I think that the invitation for us as the church is to be intentional in living as the siblings that God has called us. And it's not a metaphor. He's actually said that that's what we are, his children and siblings of one another. We just um, haven't been great at living into that truth. What does it say about our testimony to the world who look upon us as representatives of Jesus Christ if we don't stand tall as the Lord would expect us to, his expectations for us? And the reason why I ask is because I can think of one, one situation where a clergyman was doing things that, that completely were outside the, beyond the pale, as they say, and someone who I interviewed tried to bring that to the man's attention, and the man waved it off, and in the end, mm. his ministry blew up in its face, because when it finally came out, what he'd been up to, it, it just destroyed the testimony of, 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 of the Lord in that area, at least for a mm. while. And I can think That's of an, tragic. Right, and I can think of another situation Ooh. where someone, where, 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 where a man... Who was, a, who was a pastor of a congregation he started. Same, uh-huh. same sort of thing happened, and in the end, not only did he end up out of the ministry, but all of, all of the, 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 the lay leadership of the church were also ejected, as it were, because it was believed that they were aware of some of what was going on and did nothing about it, and the testimony of Jesus Christ was solid in both cases. Yeah, that's terrible. That is really, really heartbreaking, and that does that does absolutely happen. Um, and at the same time, um, Jesus said that we would know, the world would know we were disciples by how we loved one another. Mm-hmm. And Scripture has so many words for love, and we make a mistake if we think that the only love between men and women is potentially erotic love. We're supposed to love one another with agape love. Yes. You know, just un- unconditional love. We're supposed to love one another with phileo of friendship love. We're supposed to love one another with storge, strong commitment love. And there's no danger of um, affairs and treachery and adultery when we are loving each other the way with all the loves that God has given us to love one another with. That's, I think if we yes. could like dial up the love on those ones which which God has given us and which model model his family priorities. Um, I think the world would see more of his witness, not less. Thank you very much for your time, ma'am. Thanks, Paul. It was great to talk with you. Bless you. Bronwyn Lee was my guest on the last two days of WIHS Journal broadcast. For further information, call us at 860-346-1049. That's 860-346-1049. The opinions expressed are those of the participants, not necessarily those of the staff or management of the station. I'm Paul Kretschmer on the WIHS Journal, Public Affairs from WIHS, Middletown.